Hi everyone, it's Jakub Vanko for Capturing Reality. And in this video, I would like to show you some of the new features that we added in Reality Capture 1.1, also known as Blaze. And I will start with the RTK and PPK data support. For this, we added new options in the alignment settings for camera priors and control point priors. We also made some changes in the uh, ground control point import and fly log import. So we are going to take a look at those. After successful camera alignment and model reconstruction, I will demonstrate to you how to use the new AI classify tool. And this AI classify will classify the selected model. And based on the ground class, we are now able to generate a digital terrain model using the ortho projection tool. And in the end, I will show you how to use the export LOD, which means uh, export levels of detail. And we are going to take a closer look on the cesium tiles export. And you can export the cesium tiles using this tool and upload the tiles uh, manually to cesium.com. Or you can use the share button right here in the workflow tab. I will be demonstrating all of these new features on a small drone data set. So you can check all of these new features in action. Let's start with the new alignment settings first. In previous versions of Reality Capture, you could only set the camera prior weights and there were no control point settings at all. The first option for camera priors is use camera priors for georeferencing and by default it is set to yes. This means when you import a drone image and this image is containing a camera position and camera orientation in the EXIF, Reality Capture will use this information for georeferencing the project. Next, you can set the accuracy for X, Y, and Z. And these large values, so 10 meters in the horizontal plane and 20 meters for the altitude, these values are for consumer drones. So if you are using a RTK drone or a PPK drone, you can change these values accordingly. Next, we have the position prior hardness. And if you increase this value, uh, the calculated position will be closer to the prior, but it can be at the cost of losing visual connections. Next, we have the uh, camera orientation accuracy. So you can set the yo, pitch and roll accuracy. And again, you have the orientation prior hardness. And uh, this, uh, this option works in the same way as the position prior hardness. For the control point priors, the first option is image measurement accuracy, and it is in pixels. Uh, this is how accurately you are placing uh, the control points in your images. And by default, it is set to four pixels. Next, you can set the accuracy for X, Y, and Z. Uh, by default, it is five centimeters in the horizontal plane and 10 centimeters for the altitude. And the last option is define distance accuracy and the default value is one millimeter. All of these values are the global values. Uh, and that means that you can always change the uh, accuracy for individual cameras or individual ground control points. So those were the settings. And now we can start our project. I will bring in the images using the folder icon right here. Navigate to the folder that is containing my images. And I will be importing not georeferenced images because I will later georeference them using a flight log. So I have the folder selected and I can click on OK. OK, so all of the images are imported. And now when I click on one of the images, I can select this very first one and I check the prior pose. The absolute pose is unknown. This means that this image is not georeferenced. But now I will georeference all of these images using a flight log. To import a flight log, I will go up here and click on import flight log. I already have my file prepared right here and I will quickly open it in notepad to show you what is it containing. So the first column is the name of the image. The second column is the longitude. The third column is the latitude and the last column is the altitude. And the coordinate system is WGS84. 
Okay, so now I will open the flight log. And I need to check a couple of options here in this import flight log dialog. So the file format, name, latitude, longitude, altitude. I need to change this because mine, mine is uh, name, longitude, latitude and altitude. Value separator space, that is correct. Ignore first line is set to yes, but I will set it to no because my file is not containing a header. The coordinate system, I need to change it to w, uh, WGS84. And now we have the option to automatically group camera calibration. And we have three options. Do not group all in one group as fixed lens was used or use the focal length to group camera intrinsic parameters. In my case, these two options are the same because uh, the whole data set was uh, shot with a single lens. So I can keep this, use the focal length to group cameras intrinsic parameters option. Next, we have these accuracy settings source. So we can use the global camera prior settings that are set in the alignment settings, or we can import them from a file and edit missing definitions. Uh, my, fly, my fly log is not containing the uh, accuracies, so I will edit the missing definitions. So the latitude accuracy, the default is 10 meters. I will change it to 3 centimeters, so 0 0.03. Longitude accuracy, again, I will also change it to 0 0.03. And altitude accuracy, I will change it to the double of the latitude and longitude, so in this case 0 0.06 and the units are meters. Okay, everything is set. And now I can click on okay. Reality Capture is showing me this notification. Uh, you selected a coordinate system different from the currently specified in the project settings. Yes, because by default it is set to local Euclidean and now we set uh, WGS84 and I want to set it to the project. So I'll click on this. And now the images are georeferenced. So if I click on the first image again and check the prior pose, we have the absolute pose is set to position. The absolute coordinates are in WGS84. And here we have the latitude, longitude and altitude. Even if we check the map view right here, zoom to our location. You can see that all of these images are georeferenced. You can see them right here. Okay, and now we are ready to start the alignment. I will change this back to the 3D view, close this, go to the alignment tab and click on align images. Now we are going to have to wait a couple of minutes for the alignment to finish and uh, I'll be right back. The alignment finished and now we can see the point cloud in the 3d view now i will continue by importing the ground control points i will use these ground control points to check this first alignment and then i will realign the whole project to make the point cloud even more accurate so to import them i will go up here and click on import ground control i already have my file prepared again we can check what is it containing so this time we have a header right here. Uh, the first column is the name. The second column is the, is the latitude. The third column is the longitude. And uh, the last column is the altitude. So we can click on open. Again, we need to check some of these settings if they are correct. So the file format is set to name, longitude, latitude, but I have latitude and longitude switched. So I need to choose a different file format. So the second one. Value separator is set to space. That is correct. Ignore first line is set to yes. That is also correct because this time my file is containing a header. Coordinate system is already set to WGS84. That is correct. And now let's check the position accuracy. So these are the def default values that we set in the alignment settings, but I will make the ground control points more accurate. So I will ch change the latitude and longitude to 0.02, so two centimeters. 
and the altitude to 0.044 centimeters and click on OK. Now the ground control points were imported and when I click on one of them, this is the first one, here we can see the uh, coordinate system is correct, latitude, longitude and altitude and also we can check the position accuracy Yes, it is set, set correctly uh, to latitude and longitude is 0 0.02 meters and altitude 0 0.04. Okay. Now, if I want to see these ground control points in the 3D view, I need to select all of them and click on suggest measurements. So, 54 new suggestions were created. And in the 3D view, you can see the positions of the ground control points and the relation lines between the ground control points and the cameras that, uh, that can view these ground control points. And we can already see these relations here in the 1DS. And now I need to mark these uh, ground control points in all of these suggestions, in all of these images. For this, I will change the layout. I will choose this 1 plus, plus 2 layout. I will keep the top window as the 3D view and the bottom window as the 2D view. I will select the first image for ground control point number one and I will uh, make sure that uh, this blue cursor is corresponding to this window. So now we have the green one so I will select the 2D view, go to image context and change it to blue. Okay so now this is image number 1001. To mark the ground control point's position, I will zoom in. You can already see that it is not that far from the center, from its uh, actual position. So I will click on the ground control point with my left mouse button, move the cursor to the correct position and press the down arrow key on my keyboard. This way Reality Capture will confirm this suggestion and switch to the next image, like this. Again, I will do the same for all of these images. until the last image. Okay. Now I will repeat the process for, for all the other ground control points. So now ground control point number two. I decided to fast forward this part of the video because I am doing the same process all over again and I didn't want to waste any more of your time. Okay, so I finished placing all of the ground control points and I will switch my layout back to one plus one. And now you can see that the residuals on these ground control points are around here. It is seven centimeters, four centimeters, five centimeters, eight centimeters and six centimeters. So now I will realign the project again and check the residuals uh, after the realignment. So to realign the project, I will go to the Alignment tab and click on Align Images. Now we have to wait a couple of seconds for the realignment. It shouldn't take as long as the initial alignment. The realignment finished and now you can see that the errors on the ground control points are smaller. So from one centimeter to a maximum of two centimeters. Now I am ready to reconstruct the model, but I won't be reconstructing the entire scene. Uh, I will just be reconstructing a smaller part so the reconstruction doesn't take too long. So I will switch to the top view by pressing number two on the numeric keyboard. And from this view, I will adjust the reconstruction region to a smaller part. I will adjust its size and I will also rotate it like this using the gizmo. And I will also check it from one of the side views. So if I press number four on the numeric keyboard, uh, this is the left view. And I will adjust the height of the reconstruction region so it doesn't clip the point cloud in any place. To go back to the perspective view, I will press number zero on the numeric keyboard. And now everything is set for the reconstruction. So I will go to the reconstruction tab and click on 
reconstruct on a normal detail. After the reconstruction, I will proceed with the unwrap and texturing. So I will click on unwrap settings and on unwrap parameters. I will change the large triangle removal threshold to 1000. So this way even uh, large triangles are properly unwrapped and textured. I will change the style to fixed textile size, but I will not be using the optimal textile size because the optimal textile size in this case is eight millimeters, but I will be satisfied with the resolution of uh, two centimeters. So I will change this value to custom and set the custom textile size to 0 0.02 and click on unwrap. The unwrap is finished and now I will just click on texture and the texturing will use the current UV map that was generated by this uh, last unwrap. Now our 3D model is finished and textured and uh, if you would want to create a map or a digital surface model you would use the auto projection tool. But if you want to use the digital terrain model, uh, that means that is a surface from the ground class only without any artificial objects, you first need to use the AI classify tool. And now I will show you how to use this tool. So I will close the unwrap tool because we no longer need it. And I will activate this AI classify tool. The first option uh, in our AI tool is the types of uh, classificator. You can think about this as a preset. And we have multiple types of uh, classificators. The first is an industrial complex, and then we have mixed landscapes, construction sites, city, nature, meadows, countryside, or mountains. So based on what types of terrain you are processing, you can choose this classificator. Then the next option is the type of post-processor. And this type of post-processor uh, determines how the classification will be cleaned. So you can have uh, none, you can have soft edges or hard edges. If you choose soft edges or hard edges, then you have this uh, post-processor sensitivity setting. If I choose it to, if I choose none, the setting would disappear. So back to soft edges. By default, this value is set to 0 0.5. If I would uh, put uh, zero here, then the post-processor would classify everything as uh, artificial objects. And if I would uh, type in number one, then all the post-processor would classify everything as a uh, ground class. Okay, so let's try this industrial complex uh, uh, classificator and just click on classify model. The classification finished and we already can see the classification in our 3D view. We have the uh, ground class and then we have the artificial object class. I can turn on and off the visibility of the classes. If I go here in the 1DS and find my model number one and I can turn off and on the visibility uh, under my model classes by pressing this icon. Here I can also make selections based on the classes. So if I select this artificial object in a class now I have this option to select the classification. And now when these uh, parts are selected, I can actually uh, make some operations with them. So I can filter them, for example, and remove them. Now I will deselect all the selection and I will select the lasso tool and uh, select part of the mesh. So I will select this part. And now I want to assign the artificial object class to this selection. So I need to make sure that my artificial object class is selected. And now when I click on override, the selection will be changed from ground class to artificial object class. So let's do that right now. Okay, I will deselect everything just in case. And now if I use the select artificial object class again, you can see that I changed this part from ground class to artificial object class. Now I will change it back because there is no artificial object in this area. So I'll click on ground class, make a selection like this. 
and override the selection. You can also classify only some parts of the model and this can be very useful if you're processing a very large area and this area is containing uh, different types of terrains like there's a part of a city and there's a part of a forest. So in that case you might want to make a selection and classify only the selection. So I would just uh, make a selection like this. You can even change the type of uh, pre-selector, for example this mix landscapes, construction sites and then you would uh, classify selection according to the settings. Or you can make even multiple classifications and try multiple classificators and uh, then pick the best one or, uh, or use it as a starting point and edit the classification manually. So I will do that right now. I will deselect everything. I will use this new mixed landscapes construction site, uh, sites and mines and create a second classification right now. So there are some visible changes and uh, now you can actually uh, switch between the classifications. So this is the second one and this is the first one. And I actually think that the first classification has uh, better results. So I will continue with this classification, but I will make some manual adjustments. I will switch to the top view make a selection uh, around this pile of rubble right here so I'll use the lasso tool make a selection like this and assign the artificial object class so I will click on the artificial object and override okay and I also will change this pile of wood so like this just to make sure Okay, uh, and again I will click on override. Also this part can be edited a, li a little bit. And also these parts. Override. Okay, I think that this classification is pretty good. And now we can continue with generating the digital terrain model, digital surface model, and also the orthophoto using the ortho projection tool. So I will uh, disable the lasso tool and also disable the AI classify tool. And activate the ortho projection tool. In the ortho projection tool, I will change the ortho pixel size if you remember, uh, during the unwrap, I set the maximal text size to be 0.02 centimeters. So I will put the same uh, value right here. And for the new settings, now we have the option to generate the digital terrain model. It is uh, set to on. And then we have the option to choose the classification. So we have two classifications. We have the classification 0 and classification 1. And uh, I think that the classification number zero was the better one. Let me check. This is classification number one. This is classification number zero. Okay, so I want to use classification zero for generating the digital terrain model. So now everything is set and I will click on render to generate all of the outputs. The auto projection is generated and the 3D view changed to a 2D view and it is displaying the auto photo right now. If I want to change it to the digital surface model or the digital terrain model, I have to go to the auto context tab and I have to change the source. So right now the source is image. If I click on DSM, we are looking at the digital surface model, uh, which is containing all of the artificial objects on the surface. And now when I click on DTM, we are looking at the digital terrain model uh, without the artificial objects on the surface. Another new feature is the ability to change their color palette. Right now it is set to jet and uh, we have multiple palettes available. You can change it to grayscale or any other palette. All other operations with the digital terrain model are the same as with the digital surface model. So if you want to export it to a GIS application, you would go to export and digital terrain model. 
And that will be all for the uh, AI classify tool and uh, digital terrain model generation. So now we can move on to the final part of this video and that is the LOD export. To export the level of detail, I have to go to the reconstruction tab and click on export LOD. First, I have to select the folder where I want to save my models. And for this first example, I will uh, use OBJ as my file format and click on save. Now we have a couple of settings and uh, let's take a look at them. Uh, so first is the stopping criterion. I can choose between model count and a triangle limit. If I keep it at model count, I can set how many models I want reality capture to export. So it is set at four right now. Next is the simplification type. I can set it to absolute or to relative. If I keep it to absolute, I can set the uh, maximal triangle count for the first LOD and the minimal triangle count for the last LOD. And reality capture will calculate the triangle count for the models that are in between. Next, we have the file suffix. So you can edit your file suffix, but uh, you can keep it at the default value. So the default value is underscore LOD and it will start at uh, number zero. Okay, now if I change the simplification type from absolute to relative, I can still specify the maximal triangle count for the first LOD, but now I can uh, set the relative simplification factor. And it's, it can be a value between 0 0.1 and 0 0.9. If it is set to 0 0.5, the triang uh, triangle count will be halved. Okay, I think that is all for the uh, model count uh, stopping criterion. So now I will change it to triangle limit. The simplification type for this uh, triangle limit can be only set to relative. So the relative simplification factor is the same thing as before. And now I can specify the maximal and minimal triangle count again. But this time, Reality Capture will create as many models as can fit uh, to this uh, criterion. And the file suffix is the same setting as, as before. These mesh settings are the same uh, like during the standard uh, model export. Okay, so that is the first example. Now, in the second example, uh, I will going to show you how to export the cesium 3D tiles. Like before, I have to select a folder where I want to save my 3D tiles. But instead of OBJ, I have to select cesium 3D tiles and click on save. You will get this notification that you are using an experimental feature. Just click on OK. Let's go over the settings. So first we have the initial simplification and uh, you can set the type to none, absolute or relative. If it is set to none, so there will be no initial simplification. If you set it to absolute, you can set the target triangle count. And if you set it to relative, then you can select the target triangle percentage. So if it is set to 50%, the uh, triangle count will be halved. Then we have the iter uh, iterative simplification. Here you can set the type only to relative. And again, you have the target triangle percentage and it is set to 50% by default. If your model has textures, then you can export textures. Then we have the maximum node triangle count because uh, cesium 3D tiles uh, is a hierarchy of uh, nodes of various quality. Here you can set the maximum node triangle count. And if you decrease this value, then the hierarchy will be finer. Then here is the view distance scale. If you increase this value, the triangle count in the external viewer will also increase. And last is the altitude. And you have two options. You can leave it unmodified or you could clamp it to the WGS84 ellipsoid. So when you are viewing your model in the external viewer, uh, the model will be sitting on the ellipsoid. And when all the settings are fine, can just click on OK. So this was the first way on how to export the cesium 3D tiles. But now I will show you the second way using the share button from the workflow tab. After clicking the share button, I will choose upload to cesium. 
and I already created an account on cesium.com and I also already uh, logged in with my credentials in Reality Capture for authorization. Now I can edit the model name or I can add a description and when everything is fine I will click on upload and uh, uh, if I check this box uh, the default web browser will open after upload. So everything is set so let's go. The upload to Cesium is finished and now I can view my 3D model directly in the web browser. So I have my 3D model selected in my assets and now when I go to the full screen view and I zoom into the model you can notice how the level of detail is increasing. And this is just a very small sample and you can stream entire cities or very large landscapes uh, that were created in reality capture. And now you would just start combining multiple assets together and uh, start writing your code and then publish your results to your clients. And that will be all for this video. Uh, thank you for watching. If you like this video, please give it a like and consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. Also write in the comments what kind of videos and tutorials you would like to see next. Also follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Jakub Vanko and thank you for using Reality Capture.